Anyone here want to guess what the TV show is? Fiction. Uh, that has the most seasons. Lassie was 18, but it's more than that. Nope. Uh, Law and Order was 20. Grey's Anatomy was in the low teens. It was on there. The Simpsons has 28, but there's one TV show that has more. Doctor Who. Who here knows what, what Doctor Who is? <laughs> what was that? Dr. Phil. That, no, that, that's, I would say that's not fiction, but I'm not sure that's true. <laughs> the point being, uh, the longest fictional running TV show is Doctor Who. It's on the BBC, and it's, it's about to begin its 37th season, and uh, I, I'm looking forward to it. And, and it uses a very standard structure of storytelling. It, there's the Doctor, this 2,000-year-old alien, and then there's, who, who knows everything, right? And then there's the Companion, and the Companion is the one who, who always has to have something, the Doctor is always explaining to the Companion, because the Companion doesn't know anything. And, and so, as the audience, we are the stand-in the, the, for the companion, right? That's who we identify with. That's who we, the, the doctor's always explaining to the companion the questions that we would be asking ourselves. It, it's a pretty straightforward narrative structure. It's worked really well over 37 seasons. Now, the reason I bring that up is, is that it's always this interesting question, who do you identify with when you read? or when you watch a movie, or when you, anything, any story that's being told, who do you identify with? Sometimes it's very clean. When you're watching Doctor Who, you identify with the companion, and I would highly recommend the show. Uh, it's on uh, BBC America. Often, it, it gets a little bit more complicated. When the story we're reading today, it is not very clear who we should be identifying with. There are two main actors here. There's Stephen, and there is the, the people who are persecuting him. And, and we really don't, we're not, we're not Stephen because we're not at risk due to our faith and we're not standing up for a faith that no one knows about. So we're not Stephen in this story. And, and last time I checked, we're not actively stoning people who disagree with us. Unless that's on the calendar for next month, I, I didn't see it, right? So we're not that group. And, and so we don't, I, we, we are not to identify too tightly with any of the people we read in this story. The reason I bring that up in this sort of prologue to the sermon is that this passage has been used over the centuries to condone an authorized anti-Semitic and anti-Jewish activity. Because if Stephen, a good Christian, is stoned by those damned Jews, damned as in like we're talking damnation, right? Then we Christians can persecute those Jews because they, they stoned us first. And if that strikes you as a heretical and horrible way to read that text, it is. It is wrong. But that, that's how this text has been used before. And so let's just, I'm just going to take that right there and say, ah, right? And we're going to move on into the sermon. But I, I name up front that we're not Stephen. We're not being persecuted today. Your little historical interlude. Okay, let's start with the good part. Stephen enters the church as the church is growing. And this is a fascinating moment in the church because they're growing explosively. And when you're growing like that, things like shift and creak and you got to adapt to things, right? And, and so they go through these growing pains. And, and when you have so many people coming into the church, some Jewish, some Gentile, you got to figure out how to handle that. And one of the challenges is, as they're distributing the food after worship, some of the people were not getting the food that, that they needed. And so they needed to designate some people to keep track of this. So they were going to call them deacons. Deacons comes from the Greek word diakonos. It means servant. So they need some servants. They need people to keep track of this, to make sure all the little old ladies get their food. Um, and so who are they going to pick? Who you pick as a leader in your organization tells you a lot about that organization, doesn't it? Right? So who are they going to pick? They have been led thus far by 12 Jews. Are they going to choose another set of Jews? It's been working well thus far. Or are they going to risk something and try something new? 
and they go ahead and risk something. They select seven Greeks, seven non-Jewish people who are following Jesus, who are, they're, they know that they're good, they're wise, full of the Spirit, dedicated folk. But this is an amazing move, right at the beginning of the church. So they look around and they say, these are the best people for the job. They don't look like what we're used to, but they're going to do great. So th this is the, where Stephen comes in. Stephen comes in. And he does great. He helps make sure all the little old ladies get their food. And then he's going out and he is, um, he is doing signs and wonders. We, we read about, about this. And they, um, he goes out and he does something very Jewish. He's not a Jew, but he goes out and does something very Jewish. He goes to the synagogue to argue about the Bible. Like, this is a, just what, what is the right way to read Scripture? What we would now call the Old Testament, what they're arguing about. And so, he goes there and he argues, based upon his studies and his learning, and he's picked it up, he's been a good study. And so, the way he argues for how to read Scripture, that the prophets are pointing to Jesus... Well, they can't refute it just based on the scriptures. This is a new way of reading scripture, and it seems to work, but they don't like it. And so they respond in a way that is unfortunate. They start a smear campaign, the ones who are arguing with him. They start talking about Stephen as blaspheming Moses, of talk speaking against the law. They accuse him of uh, talking about how the temple will be destroyed. And what they're really accusing him of being is being a bad Jew, which is kind of ironic, because as we've established, he's not a Jew. <laughs> That's what's so amazing about this, right? And if you, if you go back to that time, too, there really isn't a way he could have become a Jew. There isn't a process. Like, if someone walks in today and says, I love Jesus, let's do this, right? We know how to bring them into the faith. We fill that up with water, we get them wet in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and we, come on, here we go, right? We know how to bring people into the faith of Jesus Christ. But to come into uh, the Jewish faith, there wasn't a process. You could become what was called a God-fearer, which was in the Jewish practice of the day was, um, we acknowledge that, that you respect and fear God, but you're not a Jew. You could sojourn among the Jews. You could become a sojourner and live among the Jews, and that's nice. We'll smile at you and shake hands as you walk by, but you're still not a Jew. And, and so here is Stephen, not a Jew, who is arguing the Jewish scriptures with the Jews, and he's being accused of being a bad Jew. And it's a kind of a tense moment for two reasons as well. Because he is, if you read this, if you just read the text, read the story as it is, there's the tension of this story. There's the tension of this moment. Any, uh, as this, this is a book written to Theophilus, right? Anyone who loves God, Theo, God, Phyllis, love. Anyone who, my dear Theophilus is the beginning of this book. If you love God, let me tell you about the story of the church. And as you're reading the story of the church, you get to this moment and there's the narrative tension, right? Stephen is at risk here. What's going to happen? He's been accused of of, uh, being, of wanting to tear down the temple. He's being accused of pointing to a false Messiah. And here's the church bringing in all these non-Jewish folk. What raises the tension further is remembering when it's written. The book of Acts is written in the mid-70s A.D., and in 70 AD, the Roman Empire had finally had enough of Jewish revolts and had torn down the temple. Just torn it down, stone by stone. And so as, it, not only is there the tension of the story, there's the tension of the person reading the story, because they know what just happened. The entire Jewish people across the known world is like, kind of at a loss right now, because the temple is gone. And they're not quite sure what to do. And, this, and so the Jewish faith is either going to be, it's, they're not sure how this is going to unfold. What's, what's happening next? To read this story about Stephen, who is being charged with blasphemy against the temple while the temple just got torn down. Ooh, right? So Stephen stands before the Sanhedrin, the ruling council of the Jewish people, and he has this chance to respond. And if you think about your, how you would respond in that moment, think, think about it. Like, let's imagine for a minute you wake up and you get notice that you are going to be court-martialed. And you show up to a military court-martial. What's your first response? I'm not in the military, right? Why are you talking to me? This doesn't apply. That, he could have said that. Sanhedrin, Jewish ruling authorities, have you noticed anything? 
not a Jew, why am I here? Right? He could have said that. He could have responded to the accusation sort of point by point. Right? I didn't say this, I didn't say this, I didn't say this. Could have done that. That's not what he does. He tells a story. And the way he tells the story is fascinating because it's not a surprising story. He tells the story of the Jewish people from Abraham up through the prophets. This is not a surprise. The way he tells the story is interesting because of the pronouns he uses. Have you ever notice the power of a pronoun? He uses the pronoun our, our ancestors. He says our at least 10 times. Like when someone comes and visits the church, I listen to pronouns. Here's why. If someone comes in the church and asks, what do you do? What are y'all up to? What are your services? Do y'all have Sunday school? What, what are they telling me with that you and y'all? Right? And what does that mean when someone comes in and says, when do we worship? What is our building, right? That's a pretty, pretty big difference, isn't it? Right? When people start using our and we, then I know they're in. Right? Membership is good, we'll get to that. But when I hear someone come into the church and use the, ver the, the pronoun we, I get really excited because they're in. They've joined the family. And that's what we're hearing with Stephen. He's not a Jew, but listen to what, how he tells the story. Right? He talks about our ancestor, Abraham, called out of his country, God makes a covenant with him. And then our ancestor, Joseph, goes into Egypt. Our ancestors follow Joseph after the famine hit. Our ancestors increased in number until they were enslaved and then they were freed. Our ancestors then followed Moses and they whiffed at it. Right? And this is another moment that's, that's really fascinating. Because think about what it means to be family. And when you're really, you get married and you're forming a family and you start to get really close, how long does it take before you and your spouse get annoyed at your in-laws for the same reason? Think about that, right? It doesn't happen immediately, because at first, I'll be annoyed at my in-laws for something, but my wife's not annoyed at them for the same reason. Or my wife's annoyed at, at my parents for something, but I'm not annoyed at the same, same reason. It took about five or six years. And then we realized we were getting annoyed at our respective in-laws for the same reason. Right? This is the well-known principle that I can, I can critique my mama, but don't you dare talk about my mama. Right? You can't talk about my mama till we are family. And this is what he's doing. Stephen is looking at our ancestors and he's saying, and they whiffed. Come on, folks, can't you see? They whiffed following Moses. Like Moses just laid it out for them. And they came up with the golden calves. Like Stephen has become family. He's not a Jew, doesn't matter. He is family. Our ancestors, they whiffed. He's so family that he can talk about our mama. And can you just imagine what the Sanhedrin, all these Jewish guys are sitting there, can you hear their muttering? Why does he keep on saying our? What's his problem? Right? He has become part of them and they, they're having a hard time seeing it. Right? He is talking about how our ancestors, didn't they listen to the prophets? Amos told them how to worship. Isaiah said that God is far bigger than any temple. Stephen is telling this story. And the story he is weaving together is the way that God's people have been along for the ride for a long time. Right? They, were in, they started in the desert, they went into slavery, they went out of slavery. They were followed God in a tent, then they had the temple, and then they went into exile, and they came out of exile. And, and so God's people have been on the move for a long time. And now y'all want to get up tight about being right here, and this has to be the right way to do things? God's people have been along for the ride for a long time. Just look at our ancestors, and God's doing a new thing. It's not a surprise. Here we go. Let's do this. He is begging them to keep on doing what our ancestors have always done. God is doing something new. Let's charge and go with God. That ends up being the moment that I think has the most sort of punch for us today. It has the most bite, right? Because we are tempted to have an idolatry, and I think it's the idolatry of now. It's an idolatry of, of right now. Because are, are y'all comfortable? 
right? Are y'all comfortable? Y'all know where you're going to sit. Y'all know what's going to happen next. Y'all know who's going to show up. Y'all know what's going to happen next. Y'all are comfortable. And it's really tempting to, to make an idol of that, to uh, the idolatry of now. That's what the San Sanhedrin had, right? These Jewish folks, they, they were comfortable with how things were. And to for Stephen to show up and to say, hey, 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 let's go. <sighs> they were not comfortable with that. They were comfortable with right now. The response when someone shows up and points towards something new is to go, hmm, are you sure about that? Now, I don't think we're going to respond to the idea of something new in the same way that Stephen was responded to. I don't think anyone's going to get stoned today. But after reading this and letting it kick around for a bit, I, I, I hope I can say two things clearly coming off of what Stephen had to say. The first thing, where we are is good. Where we are is profoundly good. I'm so excited to get up and lead worship with y'all. This is really good. But this is not the goal. We're not there yet. We're heading somewhere, and it's not right now. We're heading into tomorrow. And it's going to be new, because God's leading us into it. And if there's one thing that's certain, if you read Scripture, is God's always doing something new. And here we go. And what's it going to look like? I don't know. But you know what it's not going to look like? It's not going to look like now. And that's okay. Where we are is good, but we're not there yet. We are heading towards the kingdom of God, and along the way we are called to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. And if you, if you heard that phrase before, you're going to hear it again. Right? That's where we're going. We're making disciples of Jesus Christ as we go, transforming the world. So that's the first thing. Where we are is good, but it's not the goal. Second, the people who help us see where we're headed are the people who are probably not in this room yet. Right? Stephen, was, he was not a good Jew because he wasn't a Jew. But he showed up and he became part of the family. And he looked around and said, look at all those folk over there. Let's go find them. And that's what happened. When someone walks in the door, they bring us a gift. Like We offer them the good news of Jesus Christ, and that's, that's a profound gift. They offer us a gift as well. Because they, they've been out there and they've seen things and we can follow them into new places the same way that the church followed Stephen. Right? He was excited about where he got to go and I can't wait to, to know where we're going to go and where we're going to go is going to depend upon what we hear from people out there. In 5, 10, 50 years, this church family is going to look very different than it does today. That's not because this today isn't good. Today is profoundly good. But it's because God continues to send us people like Stephen to help us follow where God is leading into a future. Thanks be to God. Amen.